I was just thinking about this actually earlier today because we are talking about the having this this chat and going over some things in my mind. But um, I remember someone pointing out once, you know, that the Constitution talks about the pursuing life, liberty, and happiness. But when Locke wrote it, it was property. And when the, <laughs> when the founding fathers built the government, it was built on an assumption of what the economy was, which was an agrarian economy, right? The only people who had any political power were white property men over the age of 30. And they just had the right to vote, but you had a, sort of a political elite that was in operation from um, very you know, men who had slaves, so they could afford to have, have slaves. And the, in that world, you had a lot of people who were self sustaining. They grew their own food, they bartered with their neighbors, and there was some limited trade, right? And that yeah. was where the idea of small government came from, because if you had property, then you didn't need a big government. But yeah. what people who are conservative don't realize is that fundamental third pillar of this, you know, the, the economy in terms of you know, the political and the social, has changed too. And now we have a capitalist economy where people aren't self-sustaining. And they basically, you know, they just talk about being you know, wage slaves, but we have capital as the basis of our economy. And that leaves people very vulnerable. And we need ways to redistribute the wealth of the nation so that all of its citizens prosper. It's not a, a place where people should come in from international companies, suck the wealth out, and move it into private Swiss accounts. That's robbery. Um, so we need to think about the ways that our nations produce wealth and also think about the ways that everybody enjoys it because we can't go back to the agrarian way that was the principles that conservatives preach about so often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, I would also say that I don't, not many people seem to know this, but... Um, America, when it was originally set up, there was a whole other part to the, found, the foundation and the, the way that American society was originally set up, which was anti-corporatism. They hated the big corporations. Because another thing most people don't realize is the biggest corporations in history existed hundreds of years ago, not now. The biggest corporation in history was the British East India Company, which was the most powerful and largest in terms of manpower. Well, they were basically an empire. They were a massive wing of the British Empire. They had armies, multiple armies. They conducted wars and, and all kinds of stuff, genocides. And the Americans hated that and wanted to curb corporate power as drastically as possible. And that's one of the reasons why um, the state system was really important, because they could do things like um, limit uh, corporate activity to one state. We weren't allowed to do a multi-state, interstate um, activities and that all got abolished over the years by a series of very savvy corporate lawyers but um you know on the for railroad barons and stuff but but yeah like um america was supposed to be fundamentally an anti-corporate society and looking at it now we would just be like whoa holy crap the, the founding fathers would hate what america has become hate it yeah i mean they probably George hate washington in his resignation <laughs> they'd probably hate it though because like the white people are free and stuff as well but anyway <laughs> oh yeah that too that too but like george washington in his resignation address is like don't form political parties guys don't do any of these things that i have to do and then we did all those things like mm. <laughs> he's probably spinning in his grave right now thinking about like what like what it happened it's happened to us yeah yeah and And I think the most important thing America did was actually its inspiration for other countries around the world to sort of pick up the, to be thrown the ball by the United States and run with it. You know, America hasn't really kept up in a lot of ways um, uh, in terms of like legislative progress and whatnot, like the whole um, non-single payer healthcare system. I mean, New Zealand had that since 1938. Uh, so, <laughs> and it's been working fine the whole time. I didn't know that. That's great. <laughs> Uh, in the US, you know, like in the UK, the NHS was established after a, a, a the Second World War, I believe. And there was a lot of feeling of sort of national unity. But the way that seems to express itself in the US was with the GI Bill, which yeah. primarily benefited white soldiers who are coming back. Mm. And mm. so it really limited the impact on society to the people and the families that directly mm. benefited it, but not women and not often um, uh, soldiers of color. Yeah, and um, where I was going to go with the anti-corporate thing is if you look at that kind of policy platform, it actually works consistently really well. I mean, that was part of the reason why early America was quite successful, and it was a reason why the Americans became the dominant empire in the world after World War II. 
mean, that was the era when FDR's policies were in full swing. That was a big part of why America became so successful was limiting corporate power and stuff. So uh, yeah, it, it's history revisionism to say that in order to make America great again, you have to actually reverse all that shit. It's actually the opposite. You need to put that shit back in. You, know, you need to reinstate Glass-Steagall and stuff like that. And then others yeah. would say America was never great to begin with. Yeah, I was just talking purely great in terms of like um, political will and power around the world and stuff. Mm. Yeah. Because that is increasingly becoming a joke, you know. If you look at the kind of countries that America generally attacks, they're third world countries with basically, who are basically defenseless, you know. And even then, they don't often, they don't generally win. So <laughs> it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> Yeah. That's why there's a lot of sentiment for no boots on the ground because um, people do these war cries and then people and then the citizens get stuck mired in them. Um, but yeah. somehow the, that patriotic we got to go fight everybody mentality seems to some people to be a very important part of their identity. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the what, what I call the cult of the military in America. For example, oh, like yeah. Uh, yeah, the 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 way you can most clearly um, observe it is by uh, the complete lack of anyone with any clout or, or will, say in the public sphere making an anti-military stance. That does not happen. For example, everybody, there's this that myth that everybody repeats that America is protecting, uh, the troops are protecting Americans' freedoms and protecting mm. American democracy and defending America. That's not true. American troops have not been defending America since, what, the War of 1812 or World War II? You know, it's been a long time. America doesn't defend anymore. It attacks. So, yeah, it's, yeah there's a lot of myths around uh, the military in America. I kind of under the guise of defending. Yeah, it's like for what, um, what the British Empire called forward defense in World War II. But it's not that, because these countries that we're talking about aren't actually posing a real threat to America, to other people sometimes, but not to America, you know. Iraq was not on the cusp of attacking the United States, you know. No, not at all. <laughs> no, and neither is Iran. Have you guys seen the Doug Stanhope best bit on nationalism? Uh, probably, I think I've seen all his stuff, and I saw him live once. Yeah, it's where he I... talks about, oh, you know, like, um, yeah, you know, we, we saved the French's ass. And he's like, no, I, I check my phone. I don't see any incoming or outgoing messages to or from the French needing muscle on a job. Does this sound familiar <laughs> at all? <laughs> and just like, people, are pride. people are taking pride in other people's, everyone should go watch it. Doug Stanhope on nationalism is about eight minutes long. It's hilarious. But it's about this sort of like how we take credit for deeds, well, you know, not me, but of the second world war generation, even though we're oh, in the 21st perfect. century. Yeah and use that to defend some kind of notion of American superiority over Europe in general. Yeah, and there's really interesting stuff that went on sort of behind the scenes in America during World War II. For example, uh, prior to, I think in 1942, they changed their, you know, American uh, military has always had this thing about um, making all kinds of, I can't remember there's a word for it, but when they make plans, like a just in case kind of plan, uh, they have plans for invading pretty much every country around the world if they ever needed to, you know, drawn up in advance. The preemptive stuff, they, they had a plan basically saying that um, prior to 1942, they thought the world was going to be divided up, basically the Western world, between America and Germany. And then 1942, they changed that to America and the Soviet Union. And it just shows you how, like, how fast and loose they are. They, they don't care. They were like, yeah, fuck, what if Europe falls to the Nazis? We'll have the rest of the Western world and it'll be fine. We'll work yeah. out a thing. You know? um, so yeah, they were totally willing to... to we're America again. All... Go, Tom, sorry. We're, I said that. I said we're America, damn it. <laughs> yeah. We always come out on top. Yeah, yeah. Because we say... But the, uh, it, was, it was the Soviet Union that won World War II. I think mean, anyone who has actually studied it knows that. And if you look at, um, if, I mean, yeah, they, Americans won the Pacific Theater. I'll give them that. But in terms of defeating the Germans, it was the Soviet Union who defeated the Germans by throwing millions and millions and millions of Russian people at them until, you know, <laughs> body to, ride a, to climb over, basically. You know, it was like a team from Game of Thrones, you know. There's a book called um, The Bloodlands, I think it's called, um, about World War II, um, the sort of, uh, what do you call it, the Eastern Front, and it's just about 
the level of atrocities and war crimes that were happening there in an unprecedented and not repeated since scale that is fucking mind blowing if you actually look at the look at what happened that that book's really good by the way yeah, it's part of the Second World War that tends to just become a little a paragraph or two. There's so much talk about the Holocaust. Um, yeah. And the, the kind of equal weight isn't given to the amount of yeah, mass death that happened because of yeah, the German invasion and the various you know, consequences of it. I will say, though, that um, Holocaust deniers will use a sort of version of that talking point where they'll say, hey, the Russians lost 13 million people, so... You know, why aren't we talking about that? It's like, well, it's not actually the same. They lost those 30 million, million people primarily in battles or um, through the side effects of being in war, not in camps getting gassed and shot in trenches and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not the same at all. Mm. Yeah, it's a classic diversion tactic, you know, just to stop talking about A, you try to change the subject to B. Mm -hmm. And you're like, when you go for talking about rape culture to false allegations. You know, it's the yeah. same kind of sidestep that seems to be related, mm -hmm. but basically shifts the attention away from the thing you are actually trying to bring attention to. You don't yeah. know what real oppression is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, what they call the oppression Olympics. Mm. Which is why I stay away from the word oppression, because you can get into I'm more oppressed than you, yeah. or A group is more oppressed than B group, and none of that matters. It doesn't matter. What matters is there is bad shit going on, and why don't we address all the bad shit, you know? And one person doesn't have to address it all on their own. There's lots of people in the world, <clears throat> plenty to go around. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, we're talking about A now, and then we can talk about B in another time, you know, but yeah, let's talk about A, and then let's talk about B. Yeah, yeah exactly. Which is why attacking Black Lives Matter for not talking about white people is insane. Right. Or like exactly. Thunderfoot attacking that picture of the Ghostbusters crew for not including any men in a, in a photo that was designed to highlight how many women were in the shoot. But that's not sexist, Thunderfoot. That was Jeez. legendary. <laughs> that is just the most warped thinking. That was There's incredible. no logic to that at all. <laughs> What's that? So, yeah, I know. It, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like, uh, if you look at um, the film industry, because the film industry of any, like, um, of any industry that uh, feminists look at as a, a, in terms of having a massive gender disparity, the film industry is way up there with STEM. It's, like, it's, it's absurd. And it's very gender role-y. Like, um, men always get certain kinds of jobs. Women always get other certain kinds of jobs. Like, for example, what we call continuity here or what is called script supervisor or script girl in the United States. That's a mm -hmm. historically female role. And to this day, is mostly female. Grips, on the other hand, who are thought of as needing a lot of physical strength, but in reality, they don't often need physical strength. It's actually finesse that they often need. That's mostly men, even though a lot of those jobs could be done just as easily by pretty much any woman. It's yeah, I have, a, I have a question that um, I don't know if Tom and I want to kind of preview it a little bit, but one of the problems I have with um, anti-feminist content creators is that they always take really straw man arguments or they straw man people, feminists in particular, and they always seem to pick like the most extreme examples or the weakest examples or present their arguments, their opponents' arguments in the weakest, most yeah. ridiculous way. Yeah. I just want to see them up their game and actually take on somebody who's a challenge to them. They can't. They can good arguments. Exactly. They they don't it's even so know who the, those people are, Christy. They don't know. Like, they only know the people who are under attack because, you know, like, for example, um, I was, you know, I have this um, thing that I like to have been talking about quite a lot, especially in Hangouts. I've mentioned it in the last two, um, where people often say, I'm only against the third wave, not the second, not realizing that most of the stuff they hate about the third wave was actually pioneered in the second wave. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they're talking about is absolute bollocks. I, I mentioned that um, to this guy. I said, uh, are you one of those people who says that? To this anti-feminist guy who was you know, berating me before this hangout. And he was like, what, you mean that the, the movement started by Andrea Dworkin and, um, and uh, God, what's the name of that woman who, who wrote Scum? The, those people. Valerie right? Solanus. Those, yeah, Valerie Solanus and Andrea Dworkin were extremists on the fringe of the second wave. They did not start yeah. it, nor were ever a main part of the mainstream movement. <laughs> so to characterize the second wave by those two people is insanely di disingenuous and just totally invalid. Mm -hmm. uh, agreed. Yeah, and, just, and it's that, those, they're that, building those drama that they can, you know, they have to set those up, as you point out, because the arguments, they, they don't have the arguments strength yeah. to take on actual feminist critiques. 
when I mentioned in my last hangout, uh, he was asked, sorry. Yeah, that, that comes out a lot in like recent meme culture too. Like this is something I'm up on as like a hip millennial. Uh, <laughs> but like a uh, humongous thing that just happened and like Trigglypuff and all these other uh, social justice people who have been turned into like mockeries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like on the internet. The, the humongous thing, there was just a woman who needs, who needs help. She's, she's not okay. She's unwell, that lady. She needs to go to a therapist and, and get on medication and stuff. She's mentally ill, like severely. And to put someone like her forward because she used hashtag patriarchy in a Facebook post, that proves she's a feminist. Well, I guess it does. But she never mentioned social justice once. And, and you know, wasn't going on about John Rawls or anything. To, but she gets lumped in with as an SJW yeah. because that's just the, that's the narrative, you know. And uh, trying to, to say that there's any kind of nuance involved in that group and that like 99.9% .9 of the people in feminism and social justice hate people like her. Um, and, you know, th there was no way that, <laughs> that anyone would be that I know would be interested in defending someone like that. Which is a nutcase, you know, clearly. But, you know, we get lumped in with people like that. But that's a stand-in because they don't want to face actual feminists, like, because when they do in a debate, it doesn't go so well. <laughs> I was going to bring that up, Christy. It was one of the things I w was very keen to talk to you about was the Sargon debate. Because I've been meaning to talk to you about that for a long time. I, firstly, I just wanted to say I think you did a, a fantastic job in that debate. You, you did better yeah. than I could have, I think, by quite a what. Quite quite a bit Better than any of us very really. very well done um and i actually think that sargon did such a bad job in that debate i could have done better than him in arguing Ooh. against feminism than he did because <laughs> you actually have to know shit about something to be able to argue against it right and yes, I, my arguments wouldn't have been particularly compelling against that premise of feminism being a force for good in the world but i at least could have tried to make one he didn't even try he just said a bunch of buzzwords and talked about the internet it's like, we're talking about the whole world, you know, you're talking about some stuff on the internet. Who cares? You know, I don't, what is that? How, how does that compare? It's all life, right? <laughs> that's, that's all he knows about is like stuff on the internet. And, you know, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, trying to stop FGM and, and working with Afghani feminists and stuff. Well, that's what I talk about a lot is Afghani feminism. And they don't know anything about that, you know. So they have no argument against it. So it's, I was amazed that he didn't even really try. And as, as H. Bob pointed out in that video he did about it, that his, his takeaway from it was that he overprepared. He's living in a fantasy yeah. world, man. <laughs> Total, it's just delusional. It's so amazing. Oh, he but, doesn't know and he doesn't care. He, yes, Sargon, you, you overprepare. That was, that was the problem, yeah. <laughs> it's not that you're a terrible debater and don't have any of the facts on your side. That's not at all. <laughs> I also noticed uh, on when we rewatching it that there's that one this one point where I say to him or I say to the audience and notice that he stops citing any of his sources yeah. or putting any evidence. And if you watch him in the bottom box, he does this over exaggerated sort of oh no and covers his mouth like I've done something so terribly wrong. That shows yeah. you the complaint he has for you know the, the debate and its ideas. And, and interestingly enough, after I posted the mirror of my talk about it on um, The Skeptic Feminist, someone in my comments mentioned that there was a rebuttal article to one of the citations he had in the debate having to do with the non-replicability of psychological studies. So I yeah. went to the link. I yeah, don't know if you want some like, yeah. yeah, so I don't know if you want a little bit of the background to what happened between me and Sargon where he actually did a correction on his channel sort of. Right. Um, but I'm willing to talk about it if you want to hear this story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sure. Okay, I'll try to make it brief. But um, so yeah, I, I ended up reading it and deciding it. Yeah, these people have really good points, and I sent a link to that to the Carl. And um, I'm trying to remember. I we had a, a sort of an exchange initially, and I think his first question was, or his response was, "Why didn't you bring this up sooner?" And I wrote back, LOL, like, it's not my source, you know, I, I, yeah, you were the one doing the like, research. Yeah. Why didn't you bring it up? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you were going to bring it to the debate. How could I have brought it up sooner? And I said, yeah. well, I just found out about it from a comment on my channel, and I brought it to your attention immediately. Don't you want to tell your viewers that this study has been shown to be, um, you know, have problems with it? And, and he wouldn't acknowledge that he was going to make a correction video. And I asked him a couple of times and he just kept evading me and doing other points. 
Well, I was out at the American Political Science Association conference, and before I flew out, I looked at the authors on the list. Um, and it's, I start off with Gary King, who is like the king of replication in the social sciences, if you know anything about replicating studies. And he was the person on the lead of the article about the problems with the original study. And one of the graduate students who was also on the paper had, um, was attending, and he agreed to sit down with me and I did a documentary video of his responses. And that's separate from my channel because I don't want him to kind of have to deal with people who would come over and give him hassle because he's so there's no comments and there's no visible likes or dislikes on that for, for him, for his sort of privacy. But um, Carl eventually did do a correction on, on his channel, but all he did was complain that I had been like hassling him on the internet. And then he read out the link. Uh, he read out actually from the link that I had sent him initially. Didn't try to understand the concepts in the, wor in the words in the article at all. Just read it out like he was reading an essay at school and considered that a correction. And that's not a correction. It just goes to show that he yeah. isn't committed to evidence. You know, he, he did the minimum because I think he felt he, you know, I, I pointed it out to him and it was going to be too painful if I brought up the fact that he had corrected himself before I did, before he did. That's fine. You should own your corrections. That's sure, a good yeah. thing to do. But he didn't do it in a way that was intellectually honest. He did it to make himself look like the victim and also to present information, basically, well, he didn't know it, in a way that showed that he had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah, he doesn't read stuff, you know. Yeah. I've got a, I got a video coming out soon that uh, it's about more than just him, but he's going to be in it, um, which is about uh, anti-feminists just get straight up getting shit wrong that they could have Googled in 20 seconds, you know. Um, and, yeah, it amazes me because, like like H-Bomb said about Sargon, that he was talking about um, the Dunning-Kruger effect and his theory that Sargon basically just assumes he's right and assumes he has all the facts, so he doesn't need to really check on things he just sort of mm -hmm. his whole worldview about feminism is all based on assumption that um that he knows his shit that, that he's got shit on lock you know and um the, the so there is no need to double check things you know whereas an actual academically minded person basically has the opposite frame of mind of that even though even people who know their shit will want to recheck you know before a debate or before anything where they need to actually bring up stuff They'll go back and they'll make sure, you know, he doesn't even do the original looking stuff up, let alone the double checking. So, yeah. And then in the debate, bring a wet pool noodle to a sword fight. Like he was just so ill prepared. And was, yeah. And it wasn't like the Jenny Goodchild debate where that was kind of sprung on him and he didn't have time to prepare for it. He had plenty of time to prepare for that de debate with Christie. Yeah. And he just thought he could just stroll in. It reminded me a lot, actually. Of, um, have you guys seen the documentary Best of Enemies that came out last year? No, please do tell. It's, ama it's, amazing. it's an amazing film about the series of televised, short televised debates between Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley um, during the 1968 um, DNC and RNC, the, the two conventions. They did um, a debate each night of each convention, so a total of 10 debates. And to the first debate, William F. Buckley did nothing to prepare. He went sailing just before it and did zero preparation. And um, Gore Vidal was talking about, in, in the in clips of him was, and his friends were saying that he knew that that would be the case. Um, he, and he took advantage of that. He was like, all right, Buckley's not going to do anything to prepare. I will do a ton of preparation and make him look like an idiot. And that's basically exactly what happened in the first of those 10 debates. Because he knew that his opponent wouldn't prepare. And it's the same with people like Saigon. You basically can bank on that and use it to your advantage. Yeah, he was, an off he was offered after the debate immediately a, a second debate on patriarchy where he got to form the question in his own right. wording and we would take the opposing sides and obviously he'd, he'd word it the way he wanted to. And we've never heard a wording question proposal from him since the first debate. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a joke in my opinion. He, he, there's a clip of him recently, which is the thing I'm going to be talking about in that video coming up, that really just showed him to be a joke, a fucking joke. And I'm going to shine a light on that. Um, and so, so people can just see just how fucking lazy that guy really is. And just how he, do, he, just doesn't, he doesn't care about knowledge. He doesn't care about knowing stuff. I'm not going to get any arguments until I see evidence to the contrary for me. <laughs> Yeah, and he seems to be really going downhill fast at the moment. 
you know, we're, we're ever since that, um, well, not ever since, but a good example of that is that thing he did about female autism and he did a, he was, what was he drunk when he made that video? And he was like publicly talking about how he was oh, drunk. Yeah. And, like, it's yeah. Off I'm the drunk rails and this is the greatest stuff. thing I've ever Yeah. Made. And he's like shouting about stuff all the time. And yeah, it's, he's a dad too. So like, Oh, what? that's scary. <laughs> man. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yeah, he only seems to want to engage with feminists on Twitter right now. He's been invited on a couple different feminist channels and made some agreements. And then again, like with the second debate, just the follow through wasn't there. And and yet he'll, you know, he'll post me, you know, he'll tag me into things on Twitter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he, he does not communicate with me at all and has not done so since my response to him. And before that, he was, um, you know. So I clearly hit a nerve with that video. Even Let though I didn't insult him or anything like that, you know. <laughs> Let me know how you did that. Maybe he'll leave me alone too. <laughs> well, make your video yeah. longer than five minutes. That's a good start. Because um, he doesn't seem to like that. That's <laughs> the reason he hasn't commented on my video yet. Right. But that's not just about him, though. Uh, you want to you yeah. need to put his name in the title if you want to get him to. Yeah, I need to be it. like, hey, hey, I'm going to call you out, buddy. Hey. <laughs> like poking him in the side like hey <laughs> yeah yeah there was a comment recently um because there's a, a misconception uh on my about my saigon video that he never commented on it which of course he did but it just got lost in the shuffle you know it's it's, it's in there but it's hard to find um and so there's these people saying you know where's saigon's comment and one one guy replying to that was like this guy only has three thousand subs maybe saigon doesn't even know who he is it's like you don't know saigon buddy <laughs> it doesn't matter if i had a hundred subs he would have found it it's got his name with the title oh, yeah, he yeah, found yeah. it and watched it <laughs> yeah, I, yes. I think he just he googles it you know he puts it yeah, saigon of a card into youtube and every day and just sees what comes up <laughs> he seems to watch it. all of it anything else yes. Well, not, or at not least the first, <laughs> yes, exactly. Like the first set, 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you think you get his comment in before the ad starts. <laughs> mm. well, there's probably plenty of time spent talking about it. Oh, dear. Oh, it's did you guys hear about, about Thunderfoot recently? About how he was featured in an article on World Net Daily? No, he it's, is fully ooh, been sucked into the alt right now. He is officially in the alt right. Um, he basically there was a an article about um, the Reason Rally and about how a lot of right wing atheists were trashing it, and uh, he was the most prominent person referenced in the article. Um, it was mostly about him. And one of the things it talked about was it had quotes from Ray Comfort saying, "Oh yeah, you know, Thunderfoot comes around to my house sometimes, and you know, we hang out and stuff, and we've got the whole pro life <laughs> thing in common." So. It's like, whoa, That's Jesus. <laughs> First of all, a pro-life atheist is fucking weird to get from the get-go. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he just wants to control women's bodies, I guess. Um, but, Doesn't, yeah. Shouldn't he sort of disclose that? Like, we're friends and we can have these debates, but we're on and we're chummy. I just think that somebody's so notorious that, that that would be something that he would want to disclose to his viewers just so that articles like this wouldn't come up and then people would find out um, all of, you know, kind of feel like he's been lying to them. Mm, mm. I tell you what, though, the alt-right is very good at that. They're very good at sucking people into their machine. They seem to be mm. like, very, like even people, like not even fully into the machine, just sort of getting them to embrace their talking points like they did with um, Kyle Kalinske. You know, that, that seems to happen. And Dave Rubin. Mm, what's that? Tom? And Dave Rubin. Yeah, totally. He, he's, Dave Rubin for that matter. He's, yeah. the, he's the top progressive. That guy. Did I see that, that, um, that Thunderfoot's going to be on the Rubin Report? I wouldn't surprise me. Milo's been on there. I think I saw that come through my Facebook feed oh, yeah. a couple hours ago. So, yeah. yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. Again, with the what? <laughs> so he's become enough of a joke intellectually to go on the Rubin Report. <laughs> Cricket yeah, threshold crossed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would never um, respond to a Thunderfoot video, firstly, because I, I hate the guy and he's a, he's an outright misogynist, but um, he is just, it's too easy. It's low hanging fruit. 
people who yeah. just it's so there are so many videos on youtube just him being absolutely destroyed by feminists um you know people who that's all they've done like there's a a page called um snork maiden there's logic bomb there's um facts versus anti feminists there's a bunch of people who have gone after him very very um, you know successfully people who are not well established youtubers or anything and they just yeah his arguments are just pathetic Thunderfoot versus like feminazi Ghostbusters was amazing. Sorry. Yeah, I was talking about the H Bomber guy's video. The title oh, of it yeah, again, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm actually Thunderfoot versus feminazi Ghostbusters. Yeah, I'm actually using a very very short clip from that in my next video. And uh, yeah, the 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 um <laughs> guy who go you know the guy who says I'm rational with the with the fedora and the bald cap and stuff. <laughs> I love yeah. that amazing. I'm rational. Oh, the angry game smasher. And it's me. I don't even think is Thunderfoot even a member of the Rationals these days. I don't think he is. I think they consider him a bit of a joke. You know, he would have. Was he? Was he? Did he? Was he in the thirty-two or whatever it is, twenty-seven questions for SJWs? Was he in that? No, he wasn't. No, no. Yeah, Captain yeah. Andy also. Did you guys see the Captain Andy video that he just put out in the last few days with Thunderfoot right. and all his yeah. edited verbal pauses? strung together was so good. I mean, it was that was really great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's so wild. Anyone who's, yeah, anyone who's had to edit Thunderfoot, you're like, oh, just, oh, get, just stop it. Just stop talking when you're not talking. Just close your mouth yeah. and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, he wasn't, he doesn't seem to, I mean, he's kind of associated, he's clumped in with them, if you want to say it, like a factor analysis in terms of the content and obviously the whole um, Anita Sarkeesian obsession. Like he just keeps trying to milk that cash cow. Yeah. But he doesn't seem to be um, like part of the, the clique or the group that, that really interacts quite a lot. I mean, yeah, I, I think in so far as like, you know, like um, how Sargon and TJ, you know, work together and those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I think he's obviously part of the YTAC, the YouTube atheist community, but that and the rationals are not the same thing. There's people who are not in the YouTube atheist community who are part of the rationals and vice versa. And there's people who are part of the rationals who aren't part of the atheist community. Like um, Sargon, I don't consider Sargon to be part of the atheist community. I don't even know if he is an atheist. Um, so yeah, but yeah. he's definitely, he's arguably the leader of the rationals and atheism mm -hmm. is unstoppable. Even though he was in that 27 questions video, I don't think he's one of them. You know, he's just ridiculous. He's too ridiculous. You know. It's a loose, a loose yeah, alliance of interests. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe he is. I don't know. I, I can, if yeah, I was a rational, I wouldn't want to be associated with him. He's a fucking joke. Yeah, one of the things I find interesting, uh, I said this in another hangout and got some pushback, but it's true that either the atheist, that side of the atheist community, um, want to deny that community exists, and yet they have a massive debate about the doxing and the yeah. way that they want, some people want to punish AIU is to shun him. It's basically exclude him from the community. Well, if there's no yeah. community to not be excluded from, then why are people talking about shunning him? So mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the subtle notions of how we make community um, even just along a special interest line is enough to be called a community. So their insistence that not only are they not a community, we are not a community, um, seems to go against the notions that they feel like they're being forced to accept what a community is. It, it yeah. just seems like the reverse. You know, it's like um, I don't get. I think it was Armored Skeptic that I was watching watching your. Yeah, he was the one who had him. the whole big thing about it. It, yeah, it's it's yeah. just a great it's a great example of how. People in the anti-social justice advocacy crew, they have this weird obsession with, with words. Uh, well, not with words, but with the, with the name, with the terms things are called. Rather than the actual thing itself, they care about the, word, the term used to, to label that thing. Like community, for example. I mean, it's obvious we're in a community yeah. and so are they. It's just, it's just common sense. But they get it twisted up because they don't like com, com, um, communitarian ideals and and um, you know they they mix it up with all of that and, and and conflate it with like basically socialism and collectivism and stuff. Uh -huh. Whereas it's not that; it's just a community, you know. Yeah. Plus, that pisses me off. <laughs> yeah. Well, what they I'm want if we the use. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. It's the delay. I, I, I yeah. There's a pause, and I try to fill it because I thought you hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's weird. Armored Skeptic has this whole obsession with like I don't belong to any move completely independent like he clearly has leanings and like favorites in like 
fucked, you know? Like, it's so obvious that he's trying to dis yeah. himself. He, I, he's not fooling me, you know? He wants, to, he wants to have his cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. mm. He wants to appear to be a fence-sitter while also taking positions that just happen to be profitable, you know, in terms of what his viewer base wants. If we think about the notions of uh, rigidity that they sort of, you know, um, define the word in one particular way thinkers go by, we couldn't call anything democracy that didn't resemble what happened in, in Athens. You yeah. Know, because it's like one definition. I've been criticized for using multiple definitions of patriarchy that all describe the same thing, but in a different emphasis, we're using different words depending on what the concepts I'm going to be using in the video. You know, yeah. so... This idea that somehow there's one version of what patriarchy means or racism means, and it must be, you know, less than 25 words long, and it comes, must come from a dictionary. Exactly, um, yeah. It, yeah, we, we don't do that except for things that they don't like. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, the whole obsession with what things are called just comes off as really reactionary and uncurious, you know, uh, lacking an intellectual curiosity. They don't actually care about what the things are. Um, and you can see that with things like trigger warnings. I'm guessing everyone who mocks trigger warnings aren't ableist pieces of shit, you know. They're not actually all saying fuck people with PSD, PTSD and stuff. They actually just don't know what it is. And they're just yeah. judging it entirely by what it's called. Mm. What, what really bothers me about, like, the whole ob objection to trigger warnings or to safe spaces is, like, how does this affect you in any way? It, yeah, if that's you the thing. Warning. If you don't need the safe space, these are not things that exist in your life. This is like, yeah. you know, readings on movies when you're an adult. If you're going to see an R rated movie, like, it doesn't matter to you. It doesn't affect you what the grade is. You can get into every movie. So if it helps other people and it does no harm to you, why are you spending so much time and energy hating on it? I, don't, I just don't get it. It's just like gay marriage. You know, the people opposed exactly. to gay marriage. It has no impact on your life. And if other people value it as important, who cares? You know, just let them do it. Yeah, You're not exactly. hurting anybody. Exactly. And then, you know, and, all, and that's why they have to create this straw man version of it that's destroying, you know, free thought on university campuses. That's not actually happening, but they have to say something like that because they need to have an argument against it. They don't have a real one, so they have to make one up. Just like the anti-Anita Sarkeesian people who, who straw man her on, you know, with such regularity. Yeah. It's mind-boggling, you know. I've never actually seen a critique of Anita Sarkeesian that didn't strawman her. Never. And I have watched yeah. dozens of those. Yeah. Ne they don't and exist. I, and that gets back to my point about them always taking strawman arguments. You know, take the strong, uh, strongest, not the strawman. Show mm -hmm. your case and how right, you know, we should demonstrate how convincing your argument is by taking on the strongest opponent, not making your opponent's arguments as weak as possible.